We are back. I am Andrew Langer. This is WBAL News Radio 1090 and FM 101.5. I'm very excited about this guest. As you all know, I'm a foodie. <laughs> Listen, if you spend any time listening to my show, uh, you know around the holiday times, uh, I spend a lot of time talking about cooking. Invariably, I'm posting videos to the Facebook page about what I'm up to. Uh, joining me today is a, a legitimate chef. Her name is Catherine Fulvio. Uh, you might have seen her. I know I've seen her on her PBS cooking show, uh, A Taste of Ireland. We're going to talk about uh, uh, slow food and the slow food movement and the partnership that Slow Food USA is involved in with a, a group called uh, Truly Grass Fed. Um, and and let's let's start here, Catherine. I mean, how did you become a chef? I mean, were you cooking at your your mom's or your grandmother's knee, or, or what, how did, how did this happen for you? Hello, oh, Andrew. Um, thank you for having me on, by the Always. way. But um, I grew up here on my family farmhouse in Ballynockan House and Farm in County Wicklow, and my mother opened one of Ireland's first farmhouse bed and breakfasts. Mm. Now she called it a bed and breakfast. But she actually cooked three meals a day for guests, wow. breakfast, lunch and dinner. And we grew all our own produce, which we still do as much as we can, had our hens, had our own fruit and had a dairy farm. So we produced our own milk, our own cream, our own butter. And we also sold some of our milk to the company that is now truly grass fed. Um, so my mother had to cook three meals a day. So I learned to cook from her. I was like mm. her assistant chef in the kitchen and that, nice. that kept me busy. So it's try kind of like, it's like osmosis. You know, when you're standing and you see your grandmother sure. taking loaves of soda bread out of the oven and you're watching your grandmother with the, the hand techniques, how she mixes everything with love and care. And, and then your mom comes in and makes the stews and that. You just learn by watching and slicing and dicing at the same time. Now, it, you know, it's, it's one of those things where I did a lot of cooking when I was a kid. My mother wasn't particularly... You know, she did it out of, I, I would say, almost obligation. She wasn't a, a foodie in, in that sense of the word. But there are things that I learned from her and then things that I sort of changed and, and adapted over time. But it becomes, and I guess we'll get into this as we talk about this, this slow food movement. You know, cooking to me is an expression of love, right? You, you demonstrate your, your love for your family by, by cooking for them. Uh, there are lots of ways to, to demonstrate your love for your family. One of my ways that I do it is, is by cooking. But, but talk about that and, and how that relates to this slow food movement. Slow food movement is a wonderful movement that started in Italy and it's now worldwide. And it really celebrates taking time to enjoy cooking, to enjoy local foods, and to enjoy sitting down with friends and family and savoring those moments together. So it celebrates a huge amount. It celebrates community. It celebrates local cuisine and local heritage, and it celebrates family as well. So it's a yeah. very important message that it sends there. And I'm delighted that um, in Truly Grass Fed are, are working with Slow Food because it's all very much part of the, the same message, you know? Yeah, no, I, I, I get that. And we'll talk about the, the partnership in a second, but th this, uh, this issue of, of slowing down, right? You know, we, we, especially in America, you know, we're, we're at a point where we are doing so much on the go. Everybody's lives are, are so accelerated. And, and certainly, you know, that was one of the, not that the pandemic was a great thing, but one of the, the benefits of the pandemic, you know, there was that meme that went around was that, uh, you know, this was, this was God's way of saying, we should all go sit in the corner, or go to our rooms for a little while. Um, but the, the benefit was we were able to, you know, sit down and spend more time together as a family. We were really, we were really forced to do that. Um, and I, I, I know I cherish. I had a daughter who was going off to college. Uh, the, the, you know, the following fall after the pandemic started, and to have those few more months together in that way was invaluable. And as it was, I know I'm not the only one who was experimenting with cooking. Um, I, I'd made risotto in the past, but that became like a mainstay. Um, but these sort of these other techniques and, and my, my girls have never been picky eaters. There are certain things that they wouldn't eat, but we were able to experiment more. My younger daughter, uh, learned how to make, uh, um, a, a vodka sauce. She learned how to make her own pasta. I mean, these are all, these are all important things in terms of this idea of slowing down, aren't they? Yeah. 
it's very much like that. And for us, really, during the pandemic, it gave us a chance to experiment, a chance to uh, savour what we have locally, to savour that time in the kitchen. And I think as well, because we were a lot of us were working from home, from the minute we got up in the morning, we were thinking, what's for dinner? And then <laughs> yes. also... The trip to the supermarket wasn't as exciting anymore. It was. It came with its own hazards. Yeah. Um, so people were looking at what can I get locally? What local ingredients can I get maybe delivered to me? What box of veg could be delivered to me? And that comes from local suppliers. And then, of course, suddenly you've got this box of vegetables and some of which you maybe never had before in your life or only in restaurants. And next thing you're thinking, well, how do I cook with these? Oh, yeah. So, it was, so there was the chance to experiment, not just with recipes, but with ingredients as well. And, and you had the time on your hands to experiment with the ingredients. And it was something when we were living together and cherishing that time, as you were saying, with your daughter and that it was it was time to be savoured around the dining table as well. So there, that is uh, the benefit of the pandemic. If we if we can pull benefits out. Of the I know. Past. Yes, I, I. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Uh, so let's talk about this. Let's talk about this partnership between Slow Food USA and, and Truly Grassfed. Truly Grassfed is an amazing Irish company, and they produce um, you, from local farmers about three thousand small farmers. Each farm would kind of be on average about about two hundred acres. Now, don't quote me on that, but it's around that. Um, sure. And they're all dairy farmers, obviously, and uh, they produce the most delicious milk from grass-fed cows. And the milk then goes to the creamery and from there uh, the most delicious butter is produced and cheese and ghee. So truly grass fed have the, the most, in my opinion, fabulous cheese, ghee and butter. All right. So let me ask you this because I, so I am a, a, a big proponent. First of all, I'm a big proponent of butter over margarine uh, and have been for years. Uh, obviously do a lot of cooking with butter, but it's, it's funny. And you can tell me if I'm, and I'm, I'm sure you're going to say I'm doing this wrong, which is fine. Um, I've always reserved Irish butter for as an eating butter. I know that sounds weird, but you know, like I, the, the, that's the butter that I have in my, in my crock on my counter, uh, my little butter bell here. And, and that's the one that I use to spread on bread or toast or, or what have you. And I use other regular butters for, for, for cooking, like the standard grocery store butter. I should, you're, you're, what's the, what's the sort of difference and why should I be, cooking with Irish butter uh, as opposed to just using it as, a, as an eating butter? Well, you're talking quality more yeah. than anything because the animals that we're talking about here in Ireland, they're out on the grass. And as you know, Ireland is literally 40 shades of, of green. Um, yeah. And I was going to say grey there. I don't know where that was coming from and where that was going. <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> that's another thing, isn't it? But, that's a whole um, other show. But no, really is, yeah, it is a whole other show, but it is really 40 shades of green. It's a beautiful, beautiful island full of mountains and valleys where the rain just softly falls, interspersed with sunshine. So, you know, all the tourists that come here from the United States are always so in awe of this beautiful landscape that we have in Ireland. It's green all year round. We yeah. don't get droughts in the summer and so on because we've got the mix of rainfall and sunshine. So that means that the, the cows are out about 280 days of the year approximately grazing on this grass and then when they're inside for the really colder months they're fed hay and silage from grass that was harvested throughout the summer so it's very much continuing the same process and the grass not only is it green but it's full of great nutrients and they're eating the herbs that grow alongside the grass as well and this translates into a fabulous flavor in the butter sure. and in the cheese and it's a golden color when you look at the colour of the Irish butter, this truly grass fed butter, it's so beautifully yellow. Yeah. And that's because it's grass fed. I'm, it's funny. I just got my uh, latest issue of Cook's Country, uh, which is one of my favourite magazines out there. Um, always something in there that I'm going to make. And they're having their big holiday issue. We're getting ready for Thanksgiving. I love a big production um, at, at Thanksgiving. One of the things that they are, that the recipe... And I, haven't thought about this. Now, I, I make brown butter. I use brown butter in all sorts of things. Folks, if you've never made chocolate chip cookies or even oatmeal cookies with brown butter, and, and we'll talk about what brown butter is in a second, um, you, you got to do it because it is a game changer. They have a recipe in there, Catherine, for a brown butter mashed potato, which I am dying to try. I mean, right? I mean, you can't, you know, for those of you who can't see it on the air, but we're going to have the Facebook live up, the video up uh, uh, on, on Facebook. Um, but, uh, but using brown butter in your mashed potatoes, 
for those of you who don't know, brown butter, uh, Catherine, you can tell me if I'm, if I'm saying this right, but you, you basically, you, you slowly melt the butter and you cook the butter over at low heat on the stove until the, the fats and the solids begin to brown. And it transforms the butter into this caramelly, nutty goodness, right? I mean, am I, am I right here? What do you yeah, use? Absolutely. What do you, yeah. yeah, it's the milk solids that, that brown. Yeah. Um, and uh, that's why you've got to moderate your heat when you're cooking oh, yeah. with butter. Um, so you don't suddenly blast heat on it and you, that's the, you get the best out of the butter that way. So you're right. It gives this lovely caramelized nutty flavor. And I would often make a brown butter and I would put in some capers okay. and poss possibly some finely diced anchovies. And I would put it over um, sea bass oh, or wow. some nice salmon or cod or haddock or hake. Yeah. It's sure. really nice with fish and a spritz, a spritz of lemon juice as well, of course. You know something? Mm. I've, I've I've actually so that's, nice a, that's a good idea because I I finally I finally I know you so you and I could geek out over this. The other the other recipe that I perfected uh, during the pandemic was a beurre blanc, which again I use on on everything. And it's not you know a beurre blanc sauce is a reduction of you know shallots and white vinegar, and then you cook it, and then you you add your 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 butter to it, and or, and wine uh, on occasion. And you add your cold butter to it, and it creates this amazing emulsion. I'm sorry, I know I'm all over this, and now I'm just thinking about how much better it would be with Irish butter, um, which which is fantastic. Let me let me shift gears though, uh, as we can expound the virtues of brown butter forever in a day. There is something to be said for knowing, and I know this isn't right. Not everybody can get to the farmers market, so you can you know you know if you're in a grocery store and you know where your produce is coming from, that's a good thing. Um, but if you can get to a farmer's market or you're in an area where you know folks who are growing things, I lived on the Eastern Shore of Maryland for 10 years. I knew where most of my fruits and vegetables or most of my vegetables came from. Um, even now, I know where a lot of my fruits are coming from, but there is something to be said for that. I was just out in California. I met a guy who produces uh, cured pork products, just ordered some salami and chorizo and pancetta from him. But talk about this idea of having a relationship an actual knowing, you know, relationship with the people who produce your food. That's, that's, that's important, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. You always want to know the source of your food and it gives you confidence that you're cooking with the best and that you're doing the best for your, yourself and your family. Um, and I suppose from an Irish perspective as well, here in Ireland, it's all about community and we all have our small little villages and our little towns. And to know that you're supporting a local farmer means a huge amount in a small community because that local farmer he employs local people maybe people I know too so you're very much keeping the ethos in the community yeah. supporting each other keeping the jobs in the community keeping the villages alive so they're not going to the big cities for jobs so and the money is spent in the local village so that there's more money for looking after you know the flowers and the seating for the community and the little parks and all of that Community is everything. Yeah. And by supporting small producers and specialist producers, you can really help build communities, whether it's yeah. here in Ireland or whether it's near you in the United States. And no, I think, I, yeah, I think it's, I think it's true anywhere and, and everywhere. I mean, that's, that's just it. It's funny because my, it, it, you know, I do the bulk of the grocery shopping. So I, I do most of the cooking, you know, Sunday is my day to go to the grocery store, you know, for my family. But, you know, in the summer times and into the fall, spring, summer, into the fall, when we have our farmer's market here, uh, my, my wife is the one who goes down to the farmer's market because I, I'm usually on the air when the farmer's market is going on. And, and so she's the one coming back with her bounty of, you know, tomatoes or squash or peppers, um, it, you know, what have eggs is, is, has been, has been the latest thing. She'll come back, back with her eggs. Um, and that's, you know, it's, it's, it's good sort of, sort of knowing this. We have a place, we'll just, I'll just wax poetic for a moment. So we have a place, uh, it, that we get our, our berries from. And I know that it's usually the Saturday, either right before or right after Father's Day. So, you know, right in early to mid-June that they're going to have these massive blackberries. And, and we know, we know them, they know us. We get, we get you know, uh, Charlie, come on, back up, man. So there you go. That's, for those of you that, my, my dog has just stepped on the camera here. Um, we, uh, we get these, just these, I mean, we're talking about, you know, blackberries that are as big as your thumb that we just get flats of and we bring them home. And, and we love having this relationship with them where, where, they, where they know us. Um, let's talk a little bit about, in terms of family planning, 
no, that came out wrong. In terms of planning <laughs> for meals, sorry, um, because if, as we're talking about slowing down, not everybody feels as though they can cook, uh, you know, all the time during the week. I know for me, planning is helpful. So like I will cook a big meal on Sunday and I will do as much of the preparation for Monday's meal on Sunday as I can. And then I'll use, I'll have leftovers later on in the week. Talk a little bit about that issue of planning. I, I think I'm doing that right. You know, I'm, I'm going to seek affirmation from you, uh, Chef Catherine. Am I doing that right? I mean, is that, do you, do you recommend doing that kind of a thing? Yeah, for me, um, when uh, when I'm recommending uh, meal planning, I think it's important to have an idea of what you'd like to make. Obviously, you're going to get the nicest, freshest produce along the way, but have just a set of recipes that you really like to enjoy and be flexible with them. Ones that you can sure. like change, swap out maybe the vegetables that you serve with it or change the protein, depending on what you can get. Um, and then I do prep ahead. So I do some prep on a Sunday and then uh, set myself up then for Monday and Tuesday with that. I'm a big proponent of no food waste. I think that's yeah. really important. And I think that is one of the, our biggest issues with regards to climate change around the world is that we're over purchasing. Um, rather than buying quality produce, we're buying quantity sure. because there's deals in shops and supermarkets and so on. So we end up buying, I don't know, instead of you go to the st store maybe to get one pepper and you come back with maybe 10 because they were on special offer. Sure. But you have no plan how to cook them. So I think yes. having an idea of what you'd like and having recipes that you know that when you make them, you can either eat the leftovers two days later or freeze it. I will tell you, you know, it's funny because one of my problems right now, so I, I think I now, I, I, so before cooking for four would produce way too much food. Um, you know, when I would use the packages because I couldn't get the numbers of things that I would want, whether it's the proteins or the vegetables or what have you. So invariably there would be waste. I am now on the flip side of this where I am now, while I used to be able to count on leftovers to carry me through the rest of the week, now I am cooking just enough for the three of us who are in the house. And I know it's going to be strange when I start cooking for two uh, starting next year, that's going to be a, a whole a whole nother switch. But you know, right? The, the it, it's either you have the food waste problem or you have the overeating problem. Like I don't want to let things go to waste, so I will just you know consume it. And you can sort of see I'm a, I'm a big guy. Um, but these are these are these are big issues. And this also, by the way, right? This gets into this issue of if you have a butcher counter, for instance, when you're talking about your proteins, you're able to select the exact number of things that you want in the exact size, right? You, you, you know, so, so you have less of an opportunity for waste. Am I right there? I mean, that's a, that's a, that's Absolutely, a benefit yeah. of all this. We're blessed here in Ireland, like every, every small town and village, most villages have their own butcher. Yeah. Um, and you can go in and you can just say, you know, I can, I'd like one and a quarter pounds of diced beef or, you know, you can be quite specific as to what you want so that it matches the recipe so that you're yeah. not over purchasing. I absolutely agree with you. And the same with fish. Um, we're lucky we have, we're an island, so we're surrounded by sure. sea water. So we have fish and there's, there's a little business and they drive around from village to village. Like there may be in one village on a Monday and a different village on a Tuesday. So we know on a Thursday in our local village, we get our fresh fish. It's really wow. nice. It's a lovely way to live. So, mm. okay. So you have a, do you have a, a, a favorite thing you like to cook, a favorite thing you like to eat? Oh my goodness. That's all. Oh, That's a that tough question. A I know. Question. It is because I mean I, I I like you I love everything. There's very little. I I do have a sweet tooth. I do like to bake. Um, okay. One of my favorites. Do you know it's quite um quite basic, but I I, do, I don't know do you call it a crumble or a crisp, but I love a crumble here. Okay. Um, and because it uses the the fruits in season from so we've had sure. we had loads of gooseberries this year. Um, you know the, oh, the wow. green gooseberries. Yeah, yeah, gorgeous. Sure. So I made a goo an elderflower syrup and cooked that with the gooseberries and then made a crumble topping and then served that with some delicious Irish cream. You so know, good. I am, I am, uh, I am, I am famous for my, for my crumble topping. So it's, which is just such a, so basic. Again, I should be using brown butter for it. Cause that would kick it up a notch. Um, and, and my daughter, I my, my younger daughter who doesn't, for whatever reason, does not like cooked fruit. I, I don't know. But she, but she can eat her weight and crumble, which is which is uh, astounding to me. For me, right? I, I I like simple. Actually, I'll say my favorite thing 
one of my favorite things to make is a, a chicken pot pie, you know, with leftover with leftover chicken. But you know, even just a, a roast chicken and asparagus, we're eating a lot of farro now instead of brown rice. Uh, we've we've discovered that in the last uh, even the last six months. Um, but yeah, so I made a roast chicken on Sunday with uh, farro and and uh, green beans. And then I made the other night, I turned the leftover chicken breast um, into, uh, into a, a curry chicken salad, which, which, we, in, in, which we devoured. Anyway, let's, uh, let's talk about this before I let you go. You guys have uh, some events coming up. I know you just did a, a Facebook Live where you taught people how to make Irish soda bread. Uh, that's up on your Facebook page. We'll put the link up on my show page. Um, that that uh, that uh, Slow Food USA and and, and Truly Grass Fed, uh, they've partnered. They've done. We'll ask you about this Irish soda bread uh, session in a moment. Um, but they're doing a a grilled cheese cook off with two of these junior chefs, which is very exciting. Uh, using this uh, Irish cheddar, uh, and then um, uh, there is a compound butter uh, 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 demonstration that's happening as well. And I know you make. A, I'm sure you make a lot of compound butters. But talk about talk about the Irish soda bread Facebook Live. Uh, I love a good Irish soda bread. I know my my colleague Jerry is very jealous because he's Irish. And I'll, real quick, I'm going to digress for a second. I, I I've never been to Ireland. I have a great affinity for Ireland. Uh, even after I discovered that down in County Cork, Langer is a particular pejorative, uh, which I I found that a couple of years back. Anyway, talk to us about Irish soda bread though. So yes, yeah, so, um, last week I did uh, a, a live demonstration how to make my caramelized leek and fully oh. grass-fed cheddar soda bread, and it was divine. Um, so it was my grandmother's soda bread recipe that I used. So I used the the white flour, and I rubbed some gorgeous butter into it, and used my bicarbonate of soda, baking soda, a bit of salt, grated cheddar cheese, my caramelized leeks that I caramelized in butter, of course. Of course. And, um, and I put some walnuts in as well. And then mm. I brought it all together with a mix, a, a buttermilk mix okay. and formed the traditional loaf. And that link is, I think you have that link, Andrew. Have I you, do. If anybody wants to watch it. I'll, I'll it, put it up on, on the show page. It's a delicious bread and it's so nice. And then I served it with um, some lo um, some of the, the truly grass fed um, uh, cheddar cheese. And I also had some of my own tomato relish with it. <gasps> I'm, I'm always fabulous. I, it sounds fantastic. I'm always a little intimidated to cook with leeks because you got to clean them. I mean, are, are we now, you, you still have to clean them as thoroughly as possible, right? I mean, you got to get all that, that grit out or is it not nearly as intimidating as I, as I think that it is. There's a, there's a technique to it. You top okay. and tail the leek, you slice and make a, a slice down into the center of the leek from top to bottom. Okay. And you just go just to the core. All then right. you turn the leek upside down and under the running tap, you run cold water through the leek from the top of the leek to the bottom. So the cold water runs down and pushes the grit, which there will be at go. the bottom of, the, uh, sorry, from the bottom to the top. Sure. Because if the leek comes out of the ground, the grit is up at the top of the leek. Interesting. So, yeah. So if you run the water down from the bottom to the top of the leek, if that makes sense, the, the grit falls out. Sure. No, no, no. I'll that have makes to sense do that for you. I'll have to show you that. <laughs> oh, please, please, please. We will, we will, we will have that demonstration. Yeah. Um, so, so that's that. Pretty much, I, I think sums it up. Is there anything you, uh, you, you want to add to all, all of this, uh, Chef Catherine Fulvio? I just think cooking with Irish butter is the only way forward, and I think yeah. it should be not just to put on your bread or on your toast because of that delicious flavor sure. that's in it. It's an everyday oh. ingredient here in Ireland. We wouldn't dream of using anything but truly grass-fed butter. So it's so am, worth it. All right, I am I am now going to kick it up a notch and I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to start uh, browning my butter for for more recipes. Catherine Fulvio, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Andrew.